The theme of today's event is, of course, Upgrade. And I would like to introduce you to perhaps one of the most drastic upgrades that we will see in the next few decades. An upgrade of humanity to an interplanetary species. Now, being a geologist myself, this might come across as a little bit weird. Of course, I'm an Earth scientist. Earth is already in the name. Why do we need to go to other planets? But also because geologists are often named as partially responsible for a lot of climate change we currently experience. We mine, we drill for oil, we change the landscape for agriculture. But we still have a lot of upgrading to do here on Earth. One of the ways to actually start solving this is to look outside of our comfort zone, outside of what is known and outside of our planet. To prepare for interplanetary travel, one of the safe and close by practice grounds is often known to be our moon. And when NASA announced that they were going back to the moon, boots on the moon in 2024, back to the moon, yes, back, boots on the moon back in 2024, a lot of people in the space sector were euphoric. Yes, we're finally going back. But also a lot of people were skeptic. Why do we need to go back? We've already been there. But now, of course, we're going for a completely different reason. We are going back for longer periods, we are actually staying there and possibly even surviving the lunar night. With the goal of bringing us further and learning more about where we came from. And this is not only important to discover more about our past, but it's also of great importance to understand our future. If we know more about the evolution of the Earth, we can more accurately predict its, its future. Even more so by going deeper into the solar system, for example to the Martian surface, we can measure how and what the dying of active volcanism looks like. Currently, the, one of the drivers behind plate tectonics. So, upgrading humanity, pushing ourselves to new limits, and living on the moon. That is the idea. Living on the moon, it sounds great, but how? And that's the first big question. Because living on the moon is not easy. There are a lot of space weather phenomena which makes it very hard to survive. For example, we have a lot of radiation, of course, coming from the sun, but we also have meteorite impacts, we have large thermal variances, and we have the cosmic microwave background radiation. Speaking of radiation, according to a study from the DLR, the Deutsche Luft- und Raumfahrtcenter, or German Aerospace Center, when standing on the lunar surface, the average human will receive about 260 uh, microsieverts per hour, which is about 200 times more than what you receive here on planet Earth. It's also about five to ten times more than what you receive on a transatlantic flight. So staying for longer periods or even indefinite periods of time on the lunar surface without a decent protection can be very harmful. The meteorites are a very interesting phenomenon, but also quite lethal. These usually tiny specks of dust are traveling at insane speeds of up to 25 kilometers per second. It's a similar speed to like a grain of sand being now in Bologna, now passing through the screen right here in Castel Franco Emilia, killing me if I were in person on stage, and it's already west of Parma, and it's continuing westwards, and you will never see it again. You cannot see them coming, you cannot measure them, and unless you have a very thick wall, they can actually damage you quite badly. Here on Earth, we have, of course, a very dense atmosphere, which protects us from these types of impactors. They will simply burn up. And we will say, ah, look, shooting star. We will do a, make a wish or do another silly human thing. But on the moon, it can actually be the end of you. And thirdly, the thermal variances. Yet another thing on the lunar surface which is deemed suboptimal for human survival. As some of you may know, of course, a day on the moon takes about 28, 29 days on Earth. So we have 14 days of blinding sunlight followed by 14 days of bitter and cold darkness. During these nights it's, the temperatures can go down to minus 180 degrees Celsius and during the 40 days of blinding sunlight the temperatures on the equatorial surface can rise up to well above the boiling point of water. An average temperature is between minus 40 and minus 60 degrees Celsius which is of course very cold so some global warming here might not be the worst, but still, with the temperature variance of nearly 300 degrees Kelvin, this uh, will cause excessive strain on metal alloys, for example, used in a surface habitat, especially over long periods of time. 
And if you think that's all, I'm afraid that's not it, because there is more bad news. The moon being quite old and having very little volcanic activity any in the recent billions of years or other surface renewing processes mean that everything on the surface is very old and thus also have been put to the test by these extreme phenomena for a very long time. And this weathered the surface in a very unearth-like way and a very fine-grained dust called the regolith was formed. Whereas on Earth, of course, we have these typical Earth processes. We have rain, we have rivers or wind, we ha even just life itself. And this will impact the soils in such a way that the grains will be quite rounded. You can see this, for example, when you're making a sandcastle on the beach and the grains will flow down rather than staying vertical. Whereas on the moon, these grains are strangely angular due to the lack of these processes. And these grains have an almost infinite surface area with an infinitesimally small volume, which makes that these grains will stick to mostly anything, they will react with mostly anything, and they can actually be quite carcinogenic when breathed in. So, not too nice of an environment. And in order to keep us humans safe, you will just need a lot of protection. But that's still a problem because of the costs. What do you think? Like one kilogram of material to the lunar surface cost? A lot, yes. But the current estimates from the CLIPS, or the Commercial Lunar Payload Services, has actually estimated that it ranged between 1 and 1.8 million US dollars just to get one kilogram safely to the lunar surface. So we better make it a very small and lightweight house, but still with enough of protection. And an example of a relatively small space-borne habitat is, of course, the International Space Station. It's only just capable of housing 13 people for limited periods of time and it's not even well enough equipped to protect us on the lunar surface, but it's still quite heavy. With the latest additions earlier this year with the European robotic arm and the Russian Nauka module, the ISS weighs around 420,000 kilograms. So even if we get a very serious group discount on the launch or launches needed to get a habitat like this to the moon, it's just a prohibitively large amount of money. And that is where the geoscientists come into the picture. Of course, there are more resources lying around on the lunar surface than in the relatively empty space in orbit around the Earth. And by using these locally available resources, just as the rocks and the minerals or even the ice or gases inside the soils, we can save up on a lot of time, money and energy shooting stuff from the Earth to the Moon. And this is called ISRU, or in situ resource utilization. When thinking of ISRU, one can, for example, look at the rocks and the sands. And as long as the humans do not touch or breathe the regolith, you can actually use it to stack it, 3D print it, or even make concrete blocks to build walls out of. Another example is to use the ice, which is partially available in some of the craters on the lunar north and south pole to use it for rocket fuel course to water your plants and or your humans. Another very cool example, uh, especially for the chemists among us, might be uh, what the Perseverance rover did earlier this year uh, from NASA on the Martian surface. With an experiment called MOXI, the Mars Oxygen ISRU experiment, they managed to extract 5.4 grams of pure oxygen from the Martian atmosphere in just one hour. Of course this is not a lot yet. It's enough to keep one adult human breathing for about two minutes if they limit their activities, but it's still a very good place to start. However, I think the most extreme and therefore also the most interesting form of ISRU on the moon is to use whole structures available in or rather under the surface of the moon. First described in greater detail in 1971 by uh, Professor Ronald Greeley, lava tubes provide a great potential for future habitats. Lava tubes are a type of tunnel-like structure that form inside an active lava flow when they are still liquid. When the composition of the flow is just right and the shallow angle of the hill is just right, about 0.4 and 6.5 degrees, the cooling of the lava on the outside will also occur at the right rate. And this causes a thin crust to form on top of the lava flow, which will separate the hot inside from the cool outside. And even when it's 120 degrees Celsius on the lunar surface, it's still very cold in comparison to the flow itself. 
This crust will thicken, continuing to protect the flow on the inside, which will stay hot and therefore stay liquid. Eventually, this flow will continue downstream and it will seep away through cracks or through fissures. And all that we are left with is a hollow tube, a lava tube, and potentially, of course, a habitat. And this cause, uh, what's so great about them is that they consist of rigid walls and often a relatively thick ceiling. And also, like any other cave structure here on Earth or anywhere else, the inside temperature is similar to the average animal temperature. And as I said, this is around a mild minus 60 degrees Celsius on the moon, which of course is still very cold, but it's also survivably cold. With a decent heater, a small inflatable habitat with a breathable atmosphere and an airlock, and the humans are ready to go. The lava tubes on Earth are not always that stable, but that's mainly due to the weathering processes only common here on Earth. On the Moon, and even on Mars, these flows do not only exist, lava tubes in them might actually be more common than here on Earth, even when the Earth is so much bigger. And this is mainly because they are quite stable on the Moon and Mars, without wind, without rain, without snow, without mosses and plants rooting through the rocks, they can stay safe for several billions of years. And that's a good thing, otherwise we would not have been able to see them right now. Of course, they form during large-scale active volcanic events, and the Moon hasn't seen any of those in nearly 3 billion years. And that's exactly what makes the, these lava tubes extra interesting for future human space exploration. Because they are so protected from the radiation, from the meteorites, from the regolith, from the big temperature changes, the insides will not be as altered or weathered as much as the rocks that you find on the surface of the Moon or even the surface of the Earth. And this will just give us a crazy unique insight on what the rocks of the Earth-Moon system looked like several billions of years ago. It might even tell us a little bit more about the composition of the ancient Earth and how our planet was formed. And that is one of the answers to the third big question. The why. Why do we want to go into space? Why do we want to live on the Moon? Or even better, what is the benefit of space? The second reason to do so is to push people, us, humanity, outside of our comfort zone. And it's only then that we will find solutions to problems we realize we did not even have, or which might not be here yet, but can arise in the future. Pushing ourselves out of our current comfort zone and looking further to find that what we might not even realize we were looking for. It's a matter of serendipity. Uh, finding that what you needed but did not know that you were looking for. Now, great examples of this can be found in the technologies that we are actually using today in our everyday life. Without space technology, this camera would not exist and I could not have recorded this talk. The solar power bank that allowed me to charge my phone and type the script for this presentation would not have existed. Without space technologies, I would not even have been able to send this presentation to you via the internet. And when we push ourselves further, even further, who knows what more we can find and what technologies will once become common. A third big reason is a sometimes overlooked part of the human space exploration, which is the inspiration and the outreach. Not only to inspire the high-end technology or the great technological limits, but also to inspire normal human beings like you and me to take a second look at renewability and reusability. When every kilogram of food, water, supplies, tools, clothing and everything else will cost you more than one million dollars, it makes it just a little bit more attractive to fix it rather than throw it out of the window. Not that there are any openable windows in space, but still. When reusability of materials like pieces of clothing or washable water bottles become the norm in space, they will also become more common on Earth. Not just because that's how the spacey people do it, or that's just so cool in space, but also because of greater availability here on Earth. Giving back from space, from the Moon, to Earth in an ever-exchanging cycle. And the final aspect, which may still seem a little bit too far-fetched maybe, but it can be of great importance in the longer timescale, is the vulnerability of humanity as a whole. In the history of planet Earth, we have had several mass extinctions that were influential on scales that we cannot even comprehend. Like the meteorite that struck the Earth about 66 million years ago, 
It killed off 75% of all species on Earth. No land-dwelling creatures of more than 25 kilograms have survived this event, which of course included most of the dinosaurs, but it would also include humanity nowadays. And this mass extinction via meteorite was not even the worst one that we have seen in the history of planet Earth. Every single organism has a drive to survive and ensure the survival of its species. We are simply the first humans that actually might have the technology to leave the Earth and to protect us from these enormous disasters, simply by spreading out over multiple planetary bodies. We are able to provide a safe haven when everything, and quite literally everything on Earth, goes to shambles and keep at least a part of the intricate ecosystems of planet Earth alive. And that's the goal. That is the end game. Improving humanity, widening our scope, our place or places to call home, and to such an extent that we will not be able to just survive, but actually thrive as an interplanetary species. By going beyond the technology of today, and by looking on, but also definitely outside of the Earth. Giving humans a bigger place in the vast universe, so we can give back even more from the universe to Earth. Looking beyond and upgrade humanity.